today. I am so keen because we are starting our new series called Second Chances, which is based on the book of Jonah. Now, how many of us basically know the story of Jonah? My guess is that a lot of people do. The story of the guy who doesn't do what God wants him to do, so God puts him in a big fish, a whale, whatever, right? That is a story. Well, there's a lot more to the story. And so what we're going to do, we're going to do this. We're going to look at the story that a lot of people might consider as kind of a kid's story that you hear in kids' church. But the truth is, this is a story of a reluctant prophet called Jonah. And I believe that this story is going to speak into many of our lives if we are listening to the Spirit of God. Because the story of Jonah is in fact a story of second chances. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to unpack the story of second chances. And as a church, I believe that this story is so in line for where we are right now and for our personal lives. Because for the past six months, we've been in lockdown, not being able to have gatherings in our building and there's transition in leadership. And now ahead of us is a reopening. And church, we have a new opportunity, a second chance in how we're going to gather again. Because the reality is that we can't just go back to what it always was and how we always did it. It's not just business as usual. God has disrupted our lives. We have experienced it, our own storms. Many of us have been shaken in our own worlds disturbed and now I believe God has said this is your second chance because the second chance means a fresh start a fresh start in how we occupy the new thing that God is calling from us and that's why I'm so excited about our series called second chance and so I'm going to start and I'm going to look today in the book of Jonah, chapter one. And I'm gonna cover that in next week, Pastor Bobby's gonna to go to chapter two, and we're gonna go through the four chapters in the book. But today, just to set some context, Jonah one, and the Bible says this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And this is what God said. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. And then in verse three, we see Jonah's unfortunate response. Look what it says. But Jonah, take note of those words, but, but Jonah, what did Jonah do? Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Yorpa where he found a ship bound for the port and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish. And to do what? He sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. He was a man on the run. Jonah was running away from God's purposes because he wanted to do things his way. And I want us to look at the meaning behind a few of the words, because I believe that this is gonna give us some insight into the story and really get into it. First of all, Jonah, he is called and he's named the reluctant prophet. So, So he is a prophet of God and he often did what God said and he did it right. But in this particular story, We're going to find out how he didn't obey God at all. And his name, what it actually means, Jonah means dove. So he was called dove or peaceful one who ended up disobeying God. And so now is known as the reluctant prophet. And then Nineveh was the city that he was now commanded to go and preach to. But now Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Nineveh was Israel, hear me, by far, by far the worst enemy that they had to face. Israel hated the Ninevites. Like, I I mean, they hated. And you're going to see why, as we go into the study, why they hated them so much. So then let's look again at verse 1. And as we do, as we start to look at the story and unpack it over the next four weeks, my prayer 
But what I believe is that God is going to show you what he's showing me and that all of us, in all of us, there's a Jonah in us. Let's just be real. There's a Jonah in all of us. So look what it says in verse one again. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Okay, so this is good news because the word of the Lord will come to you today. And I know this because God is a God who loves to speak to us. You see, whenever God created, he said, let there be light. And there was. He created with the spoken word. John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God and the word would become flesh and dwelt among us. You see the word. God is a speaking God and he created Adam and Eve because he wanted to love and to be loved. He wanted to speak and, and have that relationship with us and with them. He spoke with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. He's a speaking God and throughout history, God speaks in different ways. God has often spoken through prophets like we're hearing now. God has spoken through circumstances. God has spoken through the voice of his Holy Spirit. If you've never heard the voice of God, hear me. You will today. And you're like, how? If you simply open your heart to his word. And look here. This is his word. It is described, it's self-described as living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. This is his word that pierces. It's truth. It's living. It will transform you. The word of the Lord will come to you and God will speak to you. And some of you, a very specific word. And I believe that today it's going to be a very specific word. And his word, it's going to ask you to change something to move in a new direction, to be obedient to what he says to you. And here's the thing, you will have a choice. You can do what God wants you to do, and that is to be obedient to his word. Or you can do what Jonah did and say, I don't want to be obedient to you. But the word of the Lord will come to you. That's the good news. The challenging part, the news for all of us. And the first thing that we see from the life of Jonah, number one, God will often ask you to do things you don't want to do. And I believe the reason we don't want to do these things that God asks us, the struggle with this, is because we really like to believe that we know what is best. You know what I'm talking about. I'm speaking to myself here. We like to convince ourselves that we know what is the best thing for our lives. Let's just be real. We all do this. We saw this right from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. They knew better. And often we feel like we know what's best. And we don't want to obey what the word of the Lord when it comes to us. And this was the context of Jonah. And we actually see this take place in verse 2. Because here is the command that God says to him. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and I want you to do what? I want you to preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And now you might be wondering, okay, well, Jonah, he is a prophet. We've established that even though he's a reluctant prophet. So that's actually what he does is to go bring and preach. He preaches God's word. So why didn't he just simply obey this request. Well, when you understand the history of Nineveh and the Syrian Empire, you understand a little more why he didn't want to go and why Jonah hated them. You see, the Syrian Empire, of which Nineveh was the capital city of, whenever there was just a rumor, hear me, just even a rumor, they don't even know if it's true, that the Syrians would be attacking somebody or a town, they were so brutal in the way that they would handle the captives. They would torture them and just be so destructive that occasionally when we heard that there was the rumor that the Syrians were going to be attacking, sometimes the whole town, listen here, would commit suicide. Literally, 
because they would rather die that way than experience what is coming for them. That is, that is hectic stuff. That, that's how much they fear the Syrian empire, that that's why they would rather commit suicide. They were hated. Now, let me tell you a little more, more about it. That, and you can read this in the history books. It's there. This is what they would do to give you some context. They would go in, they would take over a city, they would kill all sorts of people. And then the surviving woman, they would rape before them. Then they would kill them. They would often even rape the little girls and they would torture some of the kids. And then they would take the husbands who were the prisoners of the war, the men, and they would take them outside the city and hear me, they would skin them alive. Then once they were skinned, but no, they were still alive, they would actually bury them in the desert sand just up until their neck. Now, can you imagine that pain that you would be in? And you would think, okay, they would stop there. But then they would take their tongues, they would pull it, their tongues out and they would drive a stake through it so that they would go crazy because they were dying of thirst in the middle of the desert. And then once they were dead, they would behead them and they would take their heads to of all the prisoners of the war and they would make a pyramid of heads outside the city and then they would declare to the rest of the world and say, this is a city that was conquered. Okay, I know, you get the picture, am I right? Now, let me ask you this question. Now that you know all of that, the background, do we have a little more mercy on Jonah when he said, uh-uh, I don't want to go to these people, I hate these people, but... God spoke and said, I want you to do something. And in his mind, he had the legitimate reasons as to why he didn't obey. Now, maybe you can relate because I know I can. The word of the Lord will come to you and you will hear specifically from God, this is what I should do. And in your mind, you may think, God, I understand that's what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, maybe you can relate. Maybe some of you have been wronged and you are hurt and someone has hurt you. Or maybe it's someone that you love and, and you've seen how they've been hurt and the word of the Lord comes to you and says, God says, forgive them. To forgive them as you have been forgiven and you look and you go, uh, no, I don't want to do that. They don't deserve it. I don't feel like forgiving them. I know that's what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. And I know a lot of you have heard us about teaching on giving, the biblical tithe, that scripture is so crystal, it's crystal clear that God says he trusts us to manage his resources and the 10%, the first 10%, he says he trusts us that that belongs to him. So hear me, we don't, we don't actually give of our tithe. We were returning the tithe as an act of worship. And yet, a lot of you have heard this and you're like, nah, I don't want to do that. I know that's what God said, but I don't want to because in my mind, that doesn't make sense. Financially, that doesn't even make sense. I like, I like my stuff and what I have more than I want to obey God. I simply don't want to do it. Or maybe you're dating somebody and he's just so cute and she just smells good and you're messing around. And the word of the Lord will come to you and say, that's for marriage. That's not for dating. You've got a choice. And a lot of people will say, well, well, I know that. That's what God says, but I want to do this. I don't care what God says. I want to do this. It feels good. It makes me feel loved. I don't care what God says. The Jonah in all of us. And maybe the word of the Lord has come to you and you thought, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't want to do that now. Like I'll do it later. I'll get to it later when, when I'm done with that and I'm focused on work now or when I'm retired, I'll get to that. And, or when I finish high school, I'll get to that. Listen, yeah, delayed obedience is really disobedience. And I say it again. Delayed obedience is disobedience. It's kind of like parenting. You know the technique that we use with our kids? 
we do this. We say, no, no, okay, come, let's get this done. Come do this now. Come, let's do this now. No, don't make me come over there. I told you we're going to do this. Okay, now I'm serious. I'm going to count to three. And we go one, two, but now we don't actually want to get up. Two and a half, two and three quarters. Do, <laughs> do you know what we do? We're teaching delayed obedience. And I know that God has spoken to us as each church. The second chance, the new, the new land, the new ground that he's calling us to prepare. And God is calling us to take the steps of faith and obedience, to move out of our comfort and of obedience, to take the new steps, being willing to commit our lives. And the word of the Lord has come to us as a church. And we know what we're supposed to do. But for some of us, some of us, we feel like, but I don't want to do that. I'm comfortable where I am right here on my couch right now. I like how it used to be. I want the old way. I've gotten used to the lockdown. It's easy to go unnoticed. The thought of serving again, oh, it seems like do I really need to do that? We've been real, yeah. Because the word of the Lord will come to you. And often he will tell you to do something that you don't want to do. Jonah said, I don't want to go there. I don't want to have anything to do with these people. They make me angry. Remember this, which leads me to number two. God will speak to you. We know that the word comes to us. And he may tell you to do something that you don't want to do. But whenever God does speak, number two, you can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction. You can always find a ship moving in the other way. It's funny how that there's always other options in when God speaks. There's always another option that we can take. Adam and Eve, the apple, the prodigal son, the other places and lands that he wanted to experience you, experience. And some of you know what I'm talking about here. You say, hey, I want to be obedient, God. I want to do what you're calling me to do. And then all of a sudden, your old friend comes up and says, hey, don't do it that way. Let's go back to what we used to do. Hey, let's go back to our old life. Watch what happens here when Jonah and God says, I want you to preach to the Ninevites. And then in verse 3, Scripture says this, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and then headed for Tarshish, then went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish. Why did he sail to Tarshish? Because he wanted to run away from God. What did God say? He said, go east to Nineveh. And Jonah said, cool, 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 cool. I'm going west to Tarshish. 4,000 kilometers away from the target destination. That's how far you went. 4,000 kilometers. Give you context. That is like Cape Town to Madagascar is only 3,200 kilometers. You know the little island of Africa? One commentary even said that it would have taken about a year to sail from where he was to where he was going. Come on, guy. That is a lot of running. And some of you right now, you can relate. You might be showing on the outside to everyone. <laughs> I'm absolutely on track and I'm doing so well. <laughs> but in your heart, you've been running and you are a long, long way from God. And the word of the Lord has come to you. Here's what I want you to do. And somewhere along the way, whether it's been months or weeks or even years back, you said, no. No, I don't want to do what you want me to do, God. I don't want to obey you. And you've been on the run and you're thinking you can get away with it. You need to understand. You can run for a while, but you can't run forever. You cannot run forever because it catches you out. But maybe, and this is real, maybe you're not even so much on the run but you're actually just drifting. You are drifting. 
You heard me share the story when we were on holiday floating down that river, having the best time of our lives with that yellow lilo. I now curse that yellow lilo still to this day. And I remember still checking out for our big blue umbrella as our landmark so we knew where we were. And without even realizing the current had changed and we had drifted so far that legit at one point, I thought trying to swim back, I thought, I don't know if we're going to make it because I'm like carrying two people on my back while trying to swim. We didn't even realize it. We didn't even realize how far we had drifted. Some of you might be able to relate to this because maybe months, maybe it was before lockdown or even years ago, you were so close to God. You know what I'm talking about? You were praying and God was answering your prayers and God would prompt you to do something or say something. And so you do it or say it. And then, and then you're like, oh, wow, he's blessed me. This is just amazing. And you're serving and you're in a ministry team and you're having the best time of your life and you're in his word. And there's valuable parts that is happening every day in your life. And, and you're looking at this and you're reading. You're like, man, this is just for me in the word. And then he speaks to you again. And you're like, this is just for me. And then you go to church and you're like, God's speaking, God's speaking to me. He's like, is there anyone else in the room? Or is this message just for me? And there are these divine appointments of people. <sighs> and then one day, you skip church. And next week, you skip life group. I'm doing okay. So you put down the word. You stop reading it. Then you don't pray as much. And you don't see as much of God's activity happening in your life. And then one day, you go like, how did I get so far from God? It wasn't that you were running as much as that you were drifting from Him. It's like when someone's speaking to you and you keep moving in further and further and further away. You know what happens? That voice becomes fainter and fainter. And so as we drift further away from the voice of God, we will eventually stop hearing His voice. And then we think, well, God's not speaking to me. But we have drifted away from the source. When we disobey the voice of God, whether it's intentionally or even unintentionally, we are drifting. We are separating ourselves from him, the Jonah in all of us. And the word of the Lord will come to you. And it may not be what you want to hear. And when you run, You'll always find another boat going in another direction that's maybe a little easier. But some of you right now, you are running. And this thought, number three, might speak to you. Because when you're on the run doing the wrong thing, thought number three is that God might send a storm to grab your attention, to disrupt your world. And in verse four, and Jonah was on the run, and Scripture says this. The Lord, he sent a great wind and such a violent storm across that the ship threatened to break up. Now, this was like a ship it was full of sailors. They were transporting cargo. So this is a very strong ship. It's not a dinky little rowboat that we're talking about here. And there's this great wind. And we're talking about how this happens. And you can only imagine that moment. Just imagine you were there and the ship is going up and down. And everyone's screaming. They're like, help, what is going on? What do we do? We've never seen a storm like this. So much so that the integrity of the ship was at risk. And they start to say, hold on, whose fault is this? What is going on? And they draw straws and they do like a little lottery thing. And then they said, well, it's Jonah's fault. And they said, who are you and what did you do to bring this on? And verse 8 reveals the answer. And Jonah answered them and he says, I am a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord God of heaven. Like, guys, seriously. D do you really? Do you really, Jonah, at this point in your life, are you really going to be saying, I worship the Lord of God of heaven? And he says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the God, the Lord of God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And this terrified them. And they asked, what in the world have you done? 
because they knew he was running from God. And the storm blows up and all of a sudden um, their sails are out. And then when everything's going chaos, he starts to bring God up. There's this talk about God, like, oh, <laughs> maybe now, maybe now we need God because we're in trouble. And if I'm really honest, and for a moment, I, I believe we've got a generation of people who call themselves followers of Christ, but don't live like followers of Jesus. That there's no distinction between them and someone, that person that lives next door to them that doesn't know Christ at all. It is a cultural Christianity. It's a Christianity in name only. It's a convenient Christianity because it's convenient when it suits me. Just like last week in John 6, verse 66, when Pastor Pedro shared about the crowd that walked away from Jesus because they were disappointed in him. Why were they disappointed? Because they never got what they wanted from him. We often are like that. I encourage you, go listen to last week's sermon. Well, well, as long as God does good things for me, like I go to church every now and then or something, and hopefully I'll get to heaven and he'll give me a promotion. And then if I get sick, I'll talk to him and I'll ask him, can I be healed? Or maybe it's someone else that I love and I'll ask him to be healed. And I just want to pause here for a minute and talk into this. It's church. God has called us to step into new land. And whenever he calls for something new, he always calls for a greater commitment, a greater level of trust, of obedience and faith. And hear me. There isn't space for halfway lukewarm cultural Christianity thing right now. You know, when God says, I don't want to do it, and you say, but I worship God, do we really? Do we really? Because worshiping is not just something that we just do an hour a week on a Sunday. It's a lifestyle. It's coming into the presence of God. It's a daily, every day, showing up to be with Jesus, not just a once-off occasion on a Sunday or if and when I get to life group. It is a daily surrender of Jesus, remembering God first. God first every day. But okay, back to Jonah on the boat. Now they're in the storm. And he's going and the sails are out and it's a big storm happening. And Jonah realizes, he says, guys, it's my fault. Some of you are going to recognize that right now. And you're going to think, well, well, hold on. What I'm doing in my private life, it isn't really hurting anyone else. No one else really knows. If it hadn't hurt somebody yet, hear me, it's going too soon. Now you know that strange thing where you're like, it's just, just a little sin, it's not a big thing. But it has big impact on others. Why? Because we were designed that our lives would impact others. And now Jonah realizes this. And he's like, it's my fault. I'm hurting all these innocent people by my disobedience to God. And the innocent people were those sailors on the ship. And he finally owns up to it. And we can see this in verse 12. And he says, he says, okay, guys, I'm sorry. Pick me up and throw me into the sea and it'll become calm. This whole storm, it's my fault. And he said that this great storm has come upon you. But the sailors, they have mercy on Jonah because they really care about him. And they don't even really know this guy. And so they said, we're not going to do that to you. Let's rather throw the cargo off the boat. That is the message of God for you and I today as well. Even though that it's our fault, even though we mess up over and over and over again. Psalm 86 verse 15, it says, But the Lord, your nurturing love is tender and gentle. You are slow to get angry, yet so swift to show your faithful love. You are full of abounding grace and truth. So the sailors are now willing to throw off their cargo. And this was their thing. This was their livelihood. They throw it off the boat. We're going to get rid of it. Get rid of everything to try and save you. But it didn't work. So now they're like, let's, go, let's try and get back to the shore. That didn't work either. And finally, they're like, okay, 
we're going to die. I guess we need to throw you off. And so they said, God, forgive us. We're sorry. We don't want to do this to Jonah. Jonah, we're sorry. And so they throw him overboard. And all of a sudden, the sea goes calm. And then something unbelievably bad in our human minds happens to Jonah. And if you know the story, what happens? He gets swallowed up by the big fish. And he was in the fish for three days. Can you, can you just imagine that moment? Can you imagine the smell? Fish stink in general. Now imagine being inside of them for three whole days. Which leads me to my last point, number four. Jonah's worst nightmare was exactly what he needed. In fact, it changed his direction of his life. The worst nightmare changed the direction of his life and it set him on God's path. Verse 15, 16, and 17 tells the story. Look, they said, they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to him and they made vows to him. Now check this out, what happens? What did the Lord do? But the Lord provided a great fish. The Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. You see that word, those words? The Lord provided the fish. What Jonah would have seen as the worst possible scenario, God actually provided it. And some of you right now, you may be facing what you consider as your nightmare. I mean, financially, you may be like, I'm done, it's over, no work, I, I don't see the future. And God may say, okay, do I have your attention now? Some of you might be facing a relationship that you think it just couldn't get any worse than what it is currently right now. And God may say, okay, do I have your attention? And please hear me, hear my heart. I am not saying that everything that bad happens in our life is because God is causing it. Because I don't believe that is true. But what I do believe that everything in me, that there are times when God may cause or God may allow what we would consider as our worst nightmare so that He can fully get our attention, so that we would change our direction, our lives, and put us on God's path. Romans 8, 28 says it. So we are convinced that every detail, whether the good, the bad, the uh, every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit in God's perfect plan, bringing good into our lives. And I've personally experienced this. My story of last year, where I, I've shared this before, rushed into hospital, emergency high-risk surgery, a very, very sick man. Two weeks in ICU, nearly close to one month in hospital with intensive rehab and treatments that went on for another four months that required two more surgeries. It was in this place I hit my lowest, darkest moments. Wanting to completely give up on life, living each day which felt like my worst nightmare. And it was here that I completely broke down and I surrendered all back to Jesus because I felt like I had nothing left in me. And it was in this dark place that God began to rebuild me. He began to reaffirm the call, the promises over my life. And he said, I have a plan for you, Daniel. I'm not done with you yet. And I know, I know, I know I wouldn't be where I am today, even in this position, if it wasn't for that time in the belly of the whale. Church, hear me. The word of the Lord is, will come to you. And you have a choice. Obey or disobey. Because when God speaks to you, 
there will always be another ship sailing in the wrong direction. And if you don't obey, he may send a storm to grab your attention. And if that doesn't get it, he may allow you to face your worst nightmares. And when he does, understand, understand this. It's all because he loves you. Because he has something for you to do. New ground, new land to occupy. He says there's a city, a group of people for you to impact. And we have a choice. You can't keep running. Or you can come back to him. And I pray that you would come back to him today. I want us to pray together. Father, right now, where we find ourselves, I ask that your spirit would draw us back to you. That we would recognize this fact, that we would realize that maybe we've been on the run. Maybe we, we have tried to do things in our own way and we've drifted so far, but today it's time for me to come back to you. It's time for me to repent. And your prayer today is God renew my joy of my salvation. Accept me back. Forgive me for my disobedience. I am coming back to you. And I wonder what I want you to do is to take these next few moments and make them a holy moment. Just for yourself. Remember, when Joshua and the commander of the Lord army replied, he says, take off your sandals for the, where the place that you are standing is holy. I believe that this is a holy moment right now. And I'm not going to give you the words to say, but I want you, I am going to give you the words to say, but I want you to pray. But there needs to be sincerity inside of you. A moment to say, where I'm seated, in my lounge, wherever it is, whether it's in the kitchen, whether it's in your room, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a car, wherever you are, will you make this a holy moment before God when you come into his presence? And will you pray to him in your own words? Tell him, I'm coming back. I come full on back to you and just pray and make this a moment between you and God. Father, I pray for every single person. I pray for mercy to be upon us and on behalf of us as a whole church. I ask for forgiveness if, if we have drifted, we've run away from you, we have made things and convenience and tried to do it in our own ways. I acknowledge today that we need you, that we want to be obedient to what you are saying. And so today, we come fully back to you your word. We come to you in Jesus name. Amen. And I want to encourage all of you to stay on this journey over the next few weeks. We're going to unpack the book of Jonah and God is speaking. Be open because remember his voice, he speaks. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, I want you right now where you are, push the button, Make contact with our pastoral team. The details are there. You can go to our website. There's so many ways. Don't put it off. We would love to. I would love to be able to pray with you if you made a decision today to follow Jesus. And next week, I'm excited because Pastor Bobby is preaching. So make sure you don't miss out. God bless.